welcome to Two's Country and welcome to Cornwall. This is Mausel, which is just a stone's throw away from Land's End. In fact, it's here. What's that one? That, I'm not, no, I've not seen that before. Random select. What does that do? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Wow, that's good. What do you do? Do you put all the maps into the thing and it just selects a rat? Brilliant. Well, we can let your chip do the choosing, see? I mean, there's so much in Cornwall, it'll do it for me. Take the workload off me. And whilst we're at it, you can do all the driving. Right, let's move on. Henry VIII. Not only did he have time for six wives, he also had time for about 80 castles all the way along the southern coast. Although they weren't really castles, they were artillery posts. They were here because he was worried about Rome having a go at him. This is Pendennis Castle behind me. Pen means at the head of, and Dennis is just like the Welsh, Dinas, which means castle. Cornish and Welsh are very, very similar. And that means it means castle at the head of. And boy is it, because behind me is Falmouth, and this place is perfectly situated, sticks right out into the sea. That's that bit behind me that Henry built. And this is the grounds that his daughter, Elizabeth, built and because she made it so big like that it became a military base that lasted throughout all the wars right the way up to 1950 look 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 look, look. it is interesting because there are bits all over the place from all the different periods do you want to go and have a look at one of those bits yeah which bit the tea room that really wasn't on the list oh all right i give in you win you know I wonder if Queen Elizabeth ever came here and uh, had a nice cup of char whilst they were building a castle. I suppose we'll never know. Right, time to roll the dice again. There we are, Logan Rock. What? You had to drive for 50 minutes. Oh, there's no problem with that. Anyway, not for me, because I managed to get a bit of shut eye. Now, we have uh, quite a long walk down to the rock. Yeah, it's about 15 minutes, so uh, are you ready? You'll enjoy it. Come on! What's the matter with you? It's like far from the madding crowd. Can't you feel it? Oh, come on. If you sit down, you'll never get there, will you? Anyway, you've only got to climb that. Um, actually, I don't know whether you should come up, because I think I may have gone the wrong way, and we may have to go back down again. Or we could keep going up. Um, these are all serious rock climbers. And that's Logan's Rock. Maybe they'll lend us a rope or something. That'll be alright. Yes, well, had we been able to get to the rock, which is up there it would have looked an awful lot like this it's a huge great rock which you used to be able to rock with just one finger you could push it with your finger anyway back in 1824 lieutenant goldsmith and some of his men thought it'd be a terrific wheeze to push it off the top of the cliff and so it fell down into the sea but the local villages the local villages suffered so much that the lieutenant and his men were forced to put it back on the top at their own expense. Now we need to move on, so... Um, uh, you press it.
Now we're going across the causeway to St Michael's Mount, there it is up on there. This was probably connected to the mainland at one stage but uh, the sea came in and you can only go across this at certain times of the day because for the rest of the day there's seawater up here. So we better be quick and I'll tell you about it on the other side. And that's the causeway that we just came across and we better be quick because the tide is coming in. Now, there are three St. Michael's Mounts, one in Italy, famous one in France, Mont Saint-Michel, and they were all built around about the same time. In fact, this one was built with the help of the French, and that was around 1130. There's another thing that they all have in common, and that is that they're very steep, and you can't get a car up, so come on, let's go the rest of the way. I know they look like a miniature garden from here, but those actually are the oldest gardens and they're fairly substantial, the terrace gardens in three layers around the mount. And this lovely old sundial, which sadly is an hour and 22 minutes out. An hour because of summertime and uh, 22 minutes because they put it in in the wrong place. Isn't this gorgeous though? Look at that. And come in here and take a look at this view. Stunning. You know, it's no wonder the monks chose this mount. What a lovely place to live. Yeah, okay, now look back this way, because it's time to move on. Who there? Jolly good, right, um, okay, now you're going to like this, the Cable and Wireless Company at Port Kerno. Let me show you first of all, if you come round here, see the beach down there? All of our telephone calls, pre-war and during the war, went through cables and into the ocean there and all over the world. They came down this hill, underground and out. Now, when the war started, they were a bit worried about these buildings. They thought they were a bit vulnerable to attack. So they decided to put all of the technology behind those cables underground. This is a submerged repeater. We're talking about submarine telegraphy sending messages underwater. So they got the Cornish miners to dig some tunnels under a huge hill here, put these enormous doors on them to protect them. They're even gas proof. And they put all of the technology down here. Two huge tunnels, that's the plant room or the, where the generator is so that it could be completely self-contained. Another tunnel going off that way. And down here, some of the early telegraph systems, because of course that was the first bit, sending telegraph messages. And I love the way they're all in little cute wooden boxes. All sorts of different kinds of machines for sending messages out, and also a huge map on the wall which shows Porth Kerno and all of the cables going out across the Atlantic and all over the world, bouncing off various places. And I'll show you. This is digital communication. Not like we know it today, but digital because it's done in little dots. If I turn this on, start sending the telex from London, it goes to the Ascension Isles, and then it comes around here to Cape Town, and there's my message that I've just sent being printed out. Hello? Hello? You didn't bring your mobile, did you? Mm. Hello? It's just we're running behind a bit, really. So, um, yeah, I know there's a lot of driving. There's always a lot of driving. Quit moaning. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, we better move on. Quick. Look. What is it about you and maps? What are you looking at now? Give it, give it. 
Logan's Rock. Yeah, 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 it's that place we were at this morning. What about it? What, it's... Well, it's over there. And we've been all the way up there and come back to here. Oh, well, never mind. Anyway, this is the Minic Theatre. It's spelt Minac, but it's pronounced Minic. And it's brilliant open-air theatre right on the side of the cliff. And it was started in 1932 when they put on a performance of The Tempest. And that's the lady who started it, Rowena Cade. It's her garden, which she bought for £100. And she was involved with a local repertory company who were looking for somewhere to put on The Tempest. And she said, well, why don't you use my garden? And what they did was they levelled a bit of the area down there, turned it into a lawn, which it isn't anymore. Come with me, go under there. It says staff and players only. You can be a temporary thesp. I'll take you down to the stage. It, doesn't it just make you feel all thespy? I remember, you know, I remember my time. My liege, your sword. Well, that was it. I only had a small part, you know, and then I died. Lay down for a bit, and then I had to exit stage left. But we won't do that just now. Do you know that when people come and watch performances here, and it's sold out almost every night, and people want to take part in the performances from all over the world, the audience sit with Cornish pasties and a glass of champagne. Yeah, 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 I'll sort you something out later, all right? I'll rustle up something. Now it is time to exit stage left. And they've put the name of each production on the back of one of the seats. That was the second one, Twelfth Night. No, that wasn't the one I was in, 1933. Cheeky devil. Um, I'm sorry I've dried. I need a prompt. No, not that. No, 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 no. I'll tell you what, it's time to change the scenery. So there you go, your little random selector has taken us to St. Ives. And very nice it is too. I've, uh, I've had a little uh, scratch around in the car to see if I've got anything for you. And all I came up with was a can of beer and um, a bit of water. So you better have the water, because you're driving, and I'll have the beer, all right? All right. Now, oh, I've also come up with... You know your random selector thing? I've come up with my equivalent. It's the only pack of cards where everyone is either a king or queen. It's really clever. It's got information all about them on each of the cards. Now, go on, pick a card, any card. You can take that one. Give that to me, then. Who's that? Who is it? Do you know? Edward Elder. No, he's nothing to do with Cornwall. Have another card. Go on, another card. Who's that then? Edmund the Second. No, he's nothing to do with Cornwall. I tell you what, you organise a break and I'll sort out these cards. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't think he wants to play. But I've sorted it out now. Pick any card. What have you got there? Oh, Queen Elizabeth II. Well, of course, she's connected to Cornwall because her son is the Duke of Cornwall, Charles. And pick any card. <laughs> well, would you believe it? Edward III. Do you know that he was the first Duke of Cornwall? 1337. And now, the eldest son of every king or queen automatically becomes the Duke of Cornwall. And they don't get any money from the state. They get all the money from the Duchy of Cornwall. Another interesting fact, some of the Duchy is not actually in Cornwall. Now, sup up, because we've got to move on. How did this map get in? I mean, this is just a field full of aerials. Great big concrete, yuck, the goon hilly downs. Actually, I mean, it does sound nice and historic, but I mean, look at that. What's all that about? You put it in, didn't you? What? We must keep talking. Oh, yes. 
Right, well, I've done all my genning up, and the first transmission was sent on the 11th of July, 1962. There were three of these stations around the world. The other two were the golf ball shape, but this style won the day, and now BT have four Earth stations around Great Britain. That one, number three, is taking care of the satellites over the Indian Ocean. Now, you can't see them. They're too far away. But the chances are, if you phone Australia, your call will go through that dish. What are you doing? What are you doing? There's what? The signs saying beware of the adders. Adders? Look, I, um, you go and look at the dishes, and I won't. You've got me in a silly hat again, haven't you? This shaft has only just been rediscovered, and we're the first members of the public in over a hundred years to go in it. That's if they let them in before. Come on in. Now, they've replaced all the old timbers in this section with new ones, but they've put them in in exactly the same way as they were before. And then we get into the stone tunnel with a stone roof, possibly late 1600s or even early 1700s. They're not too sure. They reckon that the mines go back to 2000 BC and the Beaker people. Now that is where this shaft ended. And that is the actual size that the men would have been working in. Just that. But they went right down here to meet up with this shaft. But we're going to go on a little further round here. The Beaker people brought with them knowledge when they came here all about metals. And they knew that if you mixed tin with bronze, with copper, you got bronze. They knew more about it than I do. And that's where the Bronze Age came from. They followed the shafts of tin down. That's a ladder, a road ladder. And then over there is a plank laid on the floor, which becomes a wooden road for the wheelbarrows to travel on. I'm trying to run my hat up and down it so you can see. The wheelbarrows would run along those planks and carry the stuff back out again. Of course, tin disappeared, or at least the mining for tin disappeared, when plastic came along, because the plastic served as the covering for metal to protect it. And that was the end of the era. These days, Givor's a museum. And you can do a bit of panning, mainly for the kids, though, which is presumably why you're doing it. Have you found anything? Some gold, is it? Actually, it's iron pyrite, or fool's gold. How appropriate. Would you like to press your button? So we're in Paul, which is just up the road from Mausel, and we're at the monument to the grave of Dorothy Pentreath who died in 1777 and is said to be the last natural born speaker of Cornish. But the language is still alive, so how can that be? Well, because people like Philip Knight still speak it, so presumably you, you, you had to learn it, Philip. Absolutely. Now, that sounded to me like Welsh, but it was Cornish, was well, it? Of course, there are great similarities between Welsh and Cornish, but it was Cornish, I assure you. And, and did, you, did you learn it because you're proud of the Cornish Celtic past, or what? Well, there's no doubt about it. If you live in Cornwall, you come to love the place very dearly, you know, and uh, it makes sense, really. If you're in Cornwall, you learn the language, especially so, if you're born there. What about Dolly? What was she like? Well, Dolly was really just a fish jouster. She used to trade from... Uh, Penzance, from Mauser rather, to Penzance, yeah. and uh, then go back again. And how do we know that she was the, you know, the last speaker of the language, or don't we? Really? Ah, well, there was a gentleman who came down from uh, England, a very learned sort of antiquarian called Danes Barrington, and uh, he decided that uh, he'd uh, look out the last uh, vestiges of the Cornish language, and he ended up in Mauser, thanks to good advice. And uh, getting there, he uh, made it known that for a wager, he 
doubted very much that he could find uh, anybody to speak Cornish. So she Dolly took on the wager. Oh, Dolly well and truly obliged, and uh, I Brilliant. think she abused him for half an hour. <laughs> This is Chai Sauster. Chai is Cornish for house, and Sauster derives its name from Sylvester. So it's fair to assume that this was Sylvester's house, or at least part of it, because it's given its name to the whole area. And this is a prehistoric village. You know, talk about things being built to last. Earlier in the programme, we were looking at Henry VIII. Now, Henry VIII was 400 years ago. This hut was constructed 4,000 years ago. <laughs> that was the hearth where they did the cooking, and this is where they prepared some of the food for the cooking. The ground corn on that very stone, which is why it's warm like that. And if you come out of one of the entrances to the hut, this is hut number six, there are lots of huts in the village, you'll see some more absolutely spectacularly preserved. All of these bumps of gorse and stone make up the village and from a prehistoric village to the global village of television press your chip now how is it that whenever there's food around you're always ahead of me hey eh? Phyllis Babcock in Le Lant. Is that how you pronounce it? That's right. Just outside St. Ives. Yeah. And you are an expert on making proper Cornish pasties? Well, I like to think I make proper pasties, yes. And I caught you just at the right time because That's you're about right. to do the... You call it the crimping? The crimping, yes. And um, we're doing the rope uh, crimping tonight. A rope? Come on, then. Yes. Oh, no, that's clever. That is very clever. Now, you, you were telling me that, that real pasties, they don't have carrots in. No. They don't have mincemeat. No way. So what do they have in that? They have either chuck steak or um, a skirt, mm -hmm. which you can't always get. But tonight, this is uh, uh, chuck steak. Some onions. Onions. Some potato, was it? Potato and uh, sweet turnip. Uh, yep. That's Leave it. Yes. I'm sorry. I can't take him anywhere. No. Now listen, uh, in all good programmes they say, here's one I pre prepared earlier. That's right. Uh, have, you got, have you got one? I just have one. There. Yeah. This is the way. Hmm. Like that? So is, is that how... We should be eating it, or should we be eating it on a plate? No, we should do it all the way, well. To do it like that? To do it like that, yes. Mm. And you see, the miners would... They, they wouldn't have, have, They might have had a bit of grease, but... Mm. And they would catch hold like that. And that is the part, they would... Yeah, but is, that, because we're is that easier for you, then? Yeah, yeah. right, OK. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say, I've really enjoyed this programme been great. I mean, using your chip and that choosing wherever we went, you know. Yeah, all right, all right, all right. So, uh, I know what you're annoyed about. You've had to do all the driving and we've been zigzagging all over the place. Yeah, all right. I, I, I admit that perhaps it isn't the most organised way to, organised way to do things. Why are you giving me all these maps? I'm driving home. Right. Well, I'll find my way then. So next time, uh, next time you're with us, we're going to Aera, down the west coast of Ireland. Absolutely breathtakingly beautiful. And you can take the ferry. No, I'm only kidding, I'm only kidding. We'll fly, it's a treat, all right? Now then, home. Uh, where's the MC? And you'll find Tim Grundy touching down in Ireland right after the break. <laughs>